glad now I know that's not good. I was going to get blood out. Hi, good evening everyone. Tonight we have the pleasure of Gene Colley. He's going to show us how to decorate a nice little bowl. He's going to turn a bowl, then he's going to come over here to the table and use dies and carving tools and make it real pretty for us. With that, I'm going to let him take it over. Okay, thank you very much. I knew that if we called this not your mother's fruit bowl, nobody would be too interested. But what we are going to do is we're going to make this bowl, or one similar to it, and we're going to go through the different steps and how I start with the tree. A lot of you guys know that we get lots of wonderful wood here in Texas. It's the most beautiful wood, the softest wood. Wait a minute. Oh, no, none of that. This is elm. And most people don't even like to turn elm, but the reason I like it, and I'll turn it like this. Uh, the reason I like it is because it's easy to carve because it's hard. If it's too soft, then you can't get, get good, straight, hard edges. So that's what we're going to work with tonight. And I'll show you how I start. I cut the tree, and of course, whenever we're all out there, there's a whole bunch of us out there cutting trees, and we all try to cut, process as much as we can, as fast as we can, and then we lose so much of it all the time, and that's why we all give it away, which is fantastic, I think. I try to get in there, and I've got a couple of chainsaws. I'll go till I've got all my blades dull, and then I go inside, and I bandsaw and cut. So you guys have all probably seen the demo at SWAT. You've seen it at AAW where they turn the green bowls, put it in the paper, put it up on a rack, and dry it. I probably have 200 bowls that are dry at the house. I don't have time to turn most of them. So I use the paper over and over again, as you can tell by my blue tape. No sense in throwing it away. And uh, this has lasted me, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. So this is what a piece of elm looks like after it's been dry. And I know there's a process of doing this. Oh, safety first, watch goes away. There's a process of weighing it. I have an easier process. It's very scientific. Throw up on the rack, and if I ever get to it, then it's dry. And uh, so usually some of these will go six months, a year, five years, two years, whatever. So we take this, and I turn a tenon on the end of it. And as you know, it's going to move. So I take, watch this thing is, is an oval. I guess you can see that, okay? And I'm now the process to get it round. Very scientific again. I'm gonna come up here and I always leave a little tiny hole from my tailstock when I rough turn it, every single time, so that I can find the center when I come back to it. Because you can't put this on a vacuum chuck, can't put it on coal jaws, so I stick it on a lathe open the jaws to a small chuck or large, depending on the size of the bowl. Wedge it up there. Now I'm going to have to put my face mask on so I don't get killed. Like I said, safety first. I never wear jewelry. Those of you that know me know I like to have a volume control because I don't use the on and off switch on my lathe because I never know what the speed was when I turned it off last time. I never tighten this. I always want to be able to come back Tighten it as I go. Probably just the opposite of what half the time you've been told. But now all I'm doing here is I'm back into the hole. If you can see that. Okay. You're never supposed to have your lathe on when you start tightening everything. Or you're using your, as somebody told me when I first learned how to really do it, as Yep, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. I have a real close friend in Kansas City, and his son is a police officer who has no hobbies other than shooting guns. And he was at a fair someplace at a carnival, and somebody was turning wood and made an ink pen. And he fell in love. He went home, bought a lathe, bought everything to turn pins, bought 20 tools. And remember, this guy's turning pins. And uh, so his dad called me and he said, you need to talk to my son. He's going crazy. His wife's going to kill him. He's buying too many tools. He has a little lathe and he has all these tools. And I called him and found out everything that he owns, probably pretty much what we all own that we don't need. And uh, he's using one tool now. And uh, 
his easy wood tool, and I said, oh man, we need to talk. And uh, so he's going to come down, and we're going to work on it. But I'm on a uh, bowl. There's the other piece. When I'm rough turning a bowl, and finish turning a bowl, I use these four tools. I have a bowl gouge with a swept back cut. You know, we all have a lot of people we've learned a lot of things from. And one of my biggest issues from a childhood, I've been turning since I was 12 years old, and the hardest thing to do was to sharpen the tool the same every time. And Jimmy Clues taught me how to use a Wolverine jig, because I had one, and I didn't. I couldn't tell you how to use a Wolverine jig. Didn't understand it, set in a box for years. He opened it up, showed me how it works, and I can duplicate my cuts, and it's a piece of cake. So anyway, we'll stop talking and we'll rough turn the outside. I'm going to come around. Now, if this bowl flies off, just go ahead and throw it right back up. I'll put it right back on. It's no big deal. I know there's all different levels of people, it sounds like. It's pretty intimidating to come to this club because you guys are all probably a lot better turners than I am. But thank goodness there's some new people here who have no clue what I'm doing wrong, if, if I am. So I just walk back and forth. As I used to tell people when I taught them how to turn bowls, I'm dancing with my lathe. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Which we just had our 41st anniversary the night before last. So... Now we know who's really crazy, don't we? It's her. Okay, so what I've done there, I've got this round so I can take a lot of the vibration out of it. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring this foot in, make it round so that we can put it and reverse the chuck. I'm using a beading tool that I've sharpened at an angle, the same as my chuck. Right there. Okay, very simple. Uh, Ellie Avacera showed me how to do the rounded sharpening. Probably one of the best turners in the world and one of the nicest people I've ever met. All I'm doing now is just bringing it in. Very simple, very slow. Because when it does bounce off, you don't want it to break your light. there. Nice little leg. First time I've ever used one of them. You can see that it moved and so did my tool when I stuck it in the wood. Okay. Now I'll just go ahead and I'll bring it on around, kind of get the, I turned it off and I turned it back on. You guys didn't see me as really fast. And, uh, The other thing that you're going to find that's really fun about this particular bowl is how much sanding I do on the outside. I'm trying to give you guys a really round shape. Those of you that remember Ben Foe told me that, uh, well, I guess that's echoing, that when I turned bowls, they were never round. So I'm trying to make it really round. He thought I made them too wedge-shaped. Okay. I like how wide the bed is, though. Okay. Yep, no problem, because it's hot. I probably, I like that. Okay. Which my phone made that sound. But you knew who it would be, right? <laughs> and yes, I do know about half of you, but I don't know him at all. Mr. Troublemaker. 
Do you see the grain in that, how beautiful that is? So actually, if you get a nice piece of the elm, it, it does finish up really nice. Okay. Let's see. Tighten. I always tighten both sides. You probably have never seen this size jaw before. I have my jaws made by a guy out in Copper Canyon. I have, uh, I have an aversion to changing jaws on my chucks. And so uh, after I got each one of the sizes that I wanted, there were two that were missing. And so the first time that I decided to get it done, I called and talked to Vicmark, and they made me a jaw, a set of jaws, but you had to buy 50 of them. So I sold 49 of them. Actually, I sold about 20 of them. And Christian from, uh, was it Wood, Wood Turner's Supply or whatever out of Vegas, he sold the rest. I traded them for Chuck's. Wood, Wood Turner's Emporium? Wood, yeah, real nice guy. Okay? All right. By the way, I'm almost finished with the outside. This is a very quiet lady, very nice. And one of the things you have to be very careful with on this hardwood like this, when you turn the outside and then you turn this top like this, you don't want your hand to go back against it because it can cut you and you bleed like a son of a gun. Right, John? <laughs> I'm not naming names or anything. I would never do that. Okay, so this this is a smaller one. So we're gonna move some of these out of the way. So I'm going to come across here. I usually come in here with a grind like this, the uh, long. I'm, I've cut the back end off of it, cut the bevel off of it so that you could get deeper in there. And then I usually, I teach a bull class. I sharpen my gouges. Because right now I'm, cut, I'm just scraping. I'm not really cutting. So with my tools, I have a one, two, and a three bevel on the end of these things. I'll show you here the, I think maybe a couple here have taken the bowl class. Okay. Okay. So the long grind is a one. Two has got more steep. Three is almost flat, okay? And then I take the heel off of each one of them. But I brought a, a small blank because I really wasn't sure which lathe you guys had tonight. And I brought this, this gouge. So I can go as far as I can because one of the big things I want in my bowl is a nice smooth curve. One of my pet peeves is when you take your fingers down that and you hit a ridge, keep going around, hit another ridge. That tells me the guy used this tool, or girl, this tool all the way through. And then they scraped along the bottom like this. Okay? And you can go a long ways by just turning the angle of the tool. But now I'm getting in a dangerous position with the tool, so I just take and change it.
come across the bottom. When I'm doing this at home, I have the, uh, oh gosh, who made the red handle tools? I just forgot his name. Glazer. I have the Glazer flat bottom bowl gouge, but it's about this long. And this bowl is way too small for that. But I knew we wanted to do some turning, not just watch somebody carve and paint. Because I know I've been to those demos. And I had some vibration. That's the downside to doing it like this, because it's very hard. The wood's very hard, but it really comes out nice. I do this I do sand the inside of these bowls most of the time. Unless I'm texturing. So now the outside of it, this is the fun part, is the, uh, the lack of sanding on these things. So now I'm going to come in and I'll pull my shape up, knowing where I'm going to put my foot. Now it's the, uh, I chipped the bowl a while ago, as you guys heard. I was trying to compensate for it. Oh, well. Great demo. Hopefully this will be on YouTube and we can all look at it later. Good. We can edit it out. That's a good idea. I didn't think of that. Now, this one's going to have a nick in the side of it. I brought a second one just in case I screwed up, but I don't want to take all night doing that. I just wanted you to see how much sanding I do on the outside. That's it. Okay. I don't do any more sanding on the outside of this bowl at all. All right. At home, I will use a vacuum chuck. I have a lathe set up that way, and I'll come back in and use the vacuum chuck on it here. I know that uh, I didn't know what that was here. Yeah, leave the mask. So I brought coal jaws so we can turn the bottom off, at least kind of give you a thought of how I do that. Remember the very first demo I ever saw was a guy that still does a lot of demo around here. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, uh, what do you do to the bottom? Because I had never owned a chuck in my life when I was very young. And uh, I said, how do you turn the bottom off? He said, oh, it's real easy. Do a jam chuck and turn the bottom off. And that was the end of his demo. It was up at uh, Golden Triangle. 
in the very early days. And, uh, and so I went up to him later and I said, hey, what, how do you turn the bottom off? Do a jam chuck, put it on there and turn it off. I didn't know what a jam chuck was. And I thought, well, that's, that's going to really be a problem. So a jam chuck, as I found out, was a chunk of wood with a pad on it that you push against it with your tailstock, which when I had my first center at the end was not really a live center. I had put oil on it. So I went up to it, and so you didn't have a bottom on your bowl. You had felt, and uh, that covered up the oil. Anyway, so this is the basic bowl. Put it in here, come in, turn it up, and make your foot. Is everybody good with that? All right. I'm going to show you now how we get to this. As you can tell, I'm one of the world's best turners because there's no mistakes in that. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the lathe. I'm not used to it. No, it was, a, it was a good lathe. This is a nice lathe. All right. Yeah. Just a little bit more. And that's actually not going to turn. Okay. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how I make the division. And... Does this have uh, any markings on it? Hmm. And this is a little different. The indexing. Oh, there it is. I don't want to lock it in. All I'm really going to do is just mark it. Sorry to do that. Should have looked at that before. I made a little jig. Uh, I think we learned how to make this one one time in an Ellie Avicera class to do ends. All I did was modify it, put another piece on the end of it so that I can do round bowls to mark. I make a lot of these little things and they're kind of fun. So. Mine, it tightens up real quick. Sorry about that. Yep, I guess I'm going to have to have the take around it. Sorry about that. Okay. I just I come and I try to get about the middle of the bowl with the jig. It's very simple markings, and I try and divide however many I think I need. I'm trying to get my grooves and my feathers, and that's what I call the cuts in between, so the feathering in a balance so that I don't have sure. Just trying to help. All right. So we'll just mark it. We're gonna be at forty eight. That's really what you've got. Okay. So I'm gonna come around here. Well, that's usually what I do. <laughs> so. 
so I just need to get this down a little bit longer. But that's okay. I'm not going to cut them all anyway. That would take too long. Okay. I do two different ones. If you looked, I think the website's got some of them on there. Where the, uh, this is pretty cool. Let's set up. I'll do it where I have a foot, like this, and then I'll do them without a foot. Those are kind of fun to do, like this one. So I thought this would be a nice little demo piece. You can see how the foot comes, and you can see it's extremely accurate. Those are tight. So let's put it. we're going to need to switch. Okay. Yep, now we're going to switch. Take that off there. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. No, it's okay. Yep, yep, pretty much. That'd be good. Okay. Yeah, I need a chair. Okay. All righty. So what we're going to do next is we're going to carve in the grooves. I'm going to show you how we put those in. And then we'll work our way through the different steps. When you're doing this, you want a vacuum cleaner close by because you're going to get dust and dirt everywhere and on you. Thank you. Okay. Alrighty, so what I started out doing with these was making them so that they weren't the same. I didn't want the lines to always be in the same place. If you go to a watermelon, uh, any kind of a fruit, and so you would come into the center of this thing and create a center and come to the side and create a center because I was trying to be a little more organic with it. And then all I would do is follow that line down. And you can see all the different ones we have here. But let's go back to this one. So I would just come through I'm off the foot, like this. I'd go, okay, I like it about this far this time. I like it about this far this time. You see okay? 
I started out trying to use a ruler, and I thought, well, that doesn't work very well. And I had one of them that uh, bent, obviously. And you're trying to find the center. You're falling your way down. And that's when I started using the tool rest. Okay, see the difference now in these two? And that was kind of the goal, was not to have them the same. And then I really decided it was easier to do it the same, and then I could make my feathers match, because I'm trying to make the angle the same. Okay. When I'm doing my first cut, I'm using the little carbide cutter, the rounded side, the rounded piece I'm using. I think this is the middle size. Okay. In fact, I, I guess you guys all have heard that the website's back up. They're selling these again. Okay. And I sit out here like this, and I'm going to pull it towards me, and I'm going to kind of get a groove into it. And you're saying, well, okay, that's round, but that will be that way in a minute. Okay. This particular cutter goes 30,000 RPM. If you go any faster than that, you're creating too much vibration. The cut, you can't control it. And so I found that that's the easiest is at about 30,000. Do what? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Is it okay? All right. It's pretty quiet. Now I have to decide how far out I want to go. Like, I don't want to bring my grooves all the way to the bottom. Okay, if it's, I should have cut this up there. But I'm going to come through here and decide how far in I want to go. And again, I'm not trying to make it to the exact center. Because you're not going to ever cut the fruit exactly in half. I've done a couple where I notched out the sides, tried to make it look like it was broken into. I've never been able to be successful with it. It just didn't look good. It looked like I was trying to cut it. So on the top of these, I run them smooth, or I come in and I stipple the top. Okay. I'm trying to get a round circle freehand without being in the center. Right there's my center. I don't want to be in the center. Okay. All right. Hopefully I'm telling you all the steps because I left that at home. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to come in and I'm going to just start to cut. And I'm trying to get down my groove. Okay. It's a, can you see it's not straight? I don't want a straight line. I'm trying to get it kind of, like I said, kind of organic. And I can clean up my line in the next step. Okay, so now I'm going to bring this one down here. If the 35,000 or 40,000 RPM microcarver, you'll burn it up, trying to take this wheel this deep. I'm probably a good solid eighth of an inch deep. trying to get it to where it's not too in and out. So my finger is actually rubbing on top of that bowl as my guide. Okay. I'm a little shallower down at the bottom. I'm a little deeper right here in the middle. And you'll see why when we come through with the next cut. Okay. All right, so my next step is with the rough, I use the, uh, the rough burrs, the uh, saber tooth. This is the medium, this is the green one. 
Okay, I think the orange one is the roughest one. I found that just to be a little too aggressive. And then I'll go to the white one here in a second. All right, now I don't normally use this tool for here. I usually use a, a, a micro, I mean a, a master carver because it's got a lot more torque and most of these will burn up. But this one only goes 15,000 RPM, so it's got a lot of torque. But again, it's not as strong as, I mean, you afford them. That's, I'm sure everybody's got a Fordham or a, uh, oh, let's see, a Dremel with a uh, handpiece on it. So I'm going a little bit slower than I would normally go. But when I said that the line doesn't have to be straight with my original tool, because I'm straightening it up a lot right now. And I can shape the direction it's going to go. But that first cut gave me my depth, my, my goal depth. I didn't want to go too deep. I didn't want to be too shallow. So I'm going to bring that right there. And that's all I'll bring there. I'm trying now. It's kind of like when you're using a piece of sandpaper. The reason you go from an 80 grit to a 120, the sanding's all done with an 80. And then the 120 is getting rid of the sanding marks from the 80 and the, the 180s getting rid of the sanding marks from the 120 all the way through. Okay. Okay. A little bit deeper there. After your first cut, it really starts to follow itself. It's really not a problem. It's the first time, and that's one of the reasons that Carver that creates the, the path, the direction we're headed. This one I can look and see if the load's too heavy on it, if I'm pulling too hard. As long as I'm not in the red, it's good. One more. It won't go through it because it takes a while to go through the wall. You see that? Did you guys see the thickness of that bowl? It's probably what five eighths of an inch. Okay, because I'm going down deep enough. If you get too shallow, it's going to vibrate or break out. I don't want it to be weak. It's always so exciting to watch somebody carve like this. It's so fast and amazing. And I did try. There's another brand out there, and I don't know who sells them, that are silver and purple. They're a little bit too aggressive for me. So I'm trying to stay with a tool that won't get out of control. Pardon? Um, I don't know what brand I there. I want to say that I got them from uh, Treeline. But. All right, so now I'm using the fine, the yellow, so this has got a lot smaller cut. And this will smooth up real well now. Okay. So now I'm trying to finish that through. I usually wear a mask. I have headphones on, sound deadeners. I have a fan that's blowing this across. Because a lot of this old wood is swampy, and it'll give you that swampy smell. This one doesn't have it, but that's one of the things about the elm. If you let it set too long, it'll get the uh, mold on it or the a little bit of black in it. I'm smoothing that up. All right, so I've got sharp edges. 
So if you can look at that, you can see the sharp edges on the cuts. And I went all the way through to the end. And you can see the lines that created with this, this ball. All right, now they'll, they're going to, uh, they're gonna go away. Because my goal now is to bring off that sharp edge. And the next tool that I'm going to use, you guys may have seen it, it's the three corner cutter. So you've got the high, the medium, and the low. And so I'm very particular now about what I'm doing. So if I come in, I'm trying to get to the center with what I call the feathering. You don't have to do this line, but it just kind of gives you a judge. All right, so I'm coming to the center here of the grooves. I'm going to be at the center here. And when I have a foot, one of the things I'm working on is trying to get a pattern. Because on this particular one, you can see the points almost like a star. Okay, so I've got my foot. I have another circle around on the star that keeps it pretty much the same distance. Then I come in and I make my marks, just like I did right there. I got this. And so by doing this, I can set my angle. And it creates that star because I'm trying to decide what pitch I want my cut to be on. Okay? I can change the pitch based on the diameter of the bowl. If I've got a narrower bowl, I want to come in with a tighter and higher pitch. I'm, my goal at that point is to give it the illusion that I'm pushing up towards the top. This is the pitch on this one. I, I don't know what that angle is, 45 degree angle close on this particular one. But I came in and I drew that little point just like I've done right here. So when you've got it on the lathe, you, or you can take a uh, compass if you've already taken it off the lathe if you want to, uh, because when I'm at this point, all I'm trying to do is get this. And so if I'm on to my next one, I can make them the same. I just like to have that a little bit uniform. Why, I don't know when I said I like all these different, but I really do, okay? All right, so now, let's see if we can see that. I will try to get these so that we can see the thing. Now I use the foot pedal just so I can control the bowl, I can control the tool. Uh, when I'm at home, I use a, uh, you know, shelf paper, or not, it, that uh, rubbery stuff that you put inside a cabinet on your shelving. That's what I use on my workbench. I have a piece of paper, and then I have one of those, and it kind of keeps it from scooting around, and it catches a little bit of the dust. I can shake it out. I can vacuum it. All right? So now I'm going to come in, and I'm going to make that first cut. And let's use the right tool. Okay. And again, I'm at 30,000 RPM. I could take this to the 35,000 RPM tool if I wanted to, because that's all right. My goal here, I'm getting this line. And all I'm doing right there is coming up to that center. You can see where I'm, if you can, is that zoomed in is good on the uh, edge? Right now I still have a sharp edge from that radius that I cut down to here. Okay. I don't want that sharp edge, so I'm going to use this tool to carve that off, but I'm still only pulling in one direction. I can go back and forth, but I'm only going, there you go. So I'm only trying to come through here, so my goal is to come into the middle of each of these valleys, okay? And I'm going to knock that sharp edge off. But I'm coming through here. I usually have this up in my lap to where it's a little bit more control, okay? All right. But now my sharp edge on this ridge is almost gone.
I'm trying to follow the same pitch, and I want, I want to show, I want you to be able to feel that groove. I'm not trying to make it dainty. Kind of the way I happened onto this was I had a piece of elm, and I turned a small little cup, and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool, but it's really boring. What can I do to it? So I drew some vertical lines on it, and I cut these little feathers on it, and it was green wood, and it burned it in. Well, the first time I did it with actually with the burner, then I burned it in with one of these. And then I came back and highlighted some of it with my burner. And then when it dried, it had discolored it all along the burn marks and it really looked cool. And I thought, okay, how can I do this? And then I took a Doug Fisher clap and Doug Fisher did a platter. And on the back side of it, I noticed he did a lot of carving on it. I thought, wait a minute, I could do something like that with it. So this, this came from different people doing different things and I looked at it and go, okay, what if I did this to that? So now I can shape, because right now I can go deep, I can take my cutter, and I can keep coming through. I want to go all the way down and mark that, because I don't want I don't want to show, like I said, I didn't sand the outside of this bowl, and I didn't sand the inside of the groove, and so now I'm covering up everything at the end. You'll see that there's only a little bit of sanding that we'll do on the outside. Where I'm going to do it, so that, but I'll show you how I do it and why. Everybody, can you see all right? All right. How long have, how long have we got left? I don't want to take too long doing these. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so now I'll pass this around so you can kind of get a feel. It's not even, but it's created, um, it's created a feathering effect. All right. All right, good. And I turn on my little vacuum. I vacuum my space. I'm good. All right, so this one, I wanted to show you this is how you can change the different shapes. And I'll pass this around and I'll show you how I drew the radius here. I put the radius on it with the lathe, and I came out here for the stars. And then you'll look at the different numbers, and the, the way your indexing is set up on the lathe, you can, you can make it even, you can make it uneven. Uh, my indexing doesn't lock on mine at all, and unless I push it in and turn it, it's too much work, so I don't really do it that way. I just hold it, pull it, hold it, turn it, with, and make the mark. All right, this one is textured on the inside of it. This one was really a hard piece of wood to turn because I had some flaws in the wood. That's why it ended up being cut off at the height that it is. And, uh, and I stopped with it. So anyway, you can see. And this one's also thin on the bottom. That's why it's just a piece to look at. And this will never get finished. But because uh, I just carved the nub off once I figured out where I was at on, a, on the thickness. And uh, if you want to pass this one around, you can. And this one will show you, oh, wait a minute, let's see if this might be the one I'm going to go ahead and use for the color. Yep, we're going to wait. I can't pass this one around yet. Because I'm going to use this to do our black. Okay. You saw the blue tape that I've got with me? When I'm doing the bottom of these, I like to do a pattern. I like to airbrush the bottom of them. I love airbrushing, it's fun. And so I'll just take and draw something on there after I'm finished. But until then, 
I'll come up here and I put the blue tape over the top. I just take a knife and cut it. And then I put black India ink over the whole thing. And that's one that I learned from Doug Fisher as well. And you'll be able to see this one. It, it'll dry pretty quickly and you can touch it. I'll try not to get the place too messy here. We won't do the whole thing so that you can see the how it comes in. So I'll use it heavy up in here, and then I'll come down to my bottom edge and I'll bring it this way. I don't if I get too much at the bottom, it'll wick around. And then I can't do what my real plan is here. Okay? I'm coming, I'm following down at that edge, and I come back down here. Because you don't want the black India ink wicking through. Any of you guys that have taken Doug Fisher's class knows the torture that he puts you through next. He makes you come back and sand all of it by hand. And there's actually a plan with that on here, and I'll show you what that is as well. We're going to only do a couple of ribs so that we're not boring everybody with putting on black paint. When I do two or three of these at a time, trust me, it gets boring. I get really tired of doing the cutting too, it gets loud, so thank goodness for iPods and headphones. If you have any questions, just let me know. More than happy to answer them. I'm such an expert on wood turning. Actually, I just have fun, and I've learned a lot from a lot of people, and so I enjoy doing it. Okay? All right. So I don't have any wicking around the top. My paper towel took that up. I'll look at it and I'll see if I need to touch up any place. I'm not concerned with getting every square inch of it covered. That's not the goal. I try to get as much of, much of it as I can. And I do shake up the paint so that I make sure the pigment is mixed evenly. All right, and at the top, it's not near as thick as here. And I'm not going to go back over it because I don't care about that. I do want the black, but I don't want it to be there very heavy. Okay, so we'll stop with that. If you want to pass this one around, you can. Don't touch the black for a few minutes, and you're good to go. Okay. All right, this one's already finished with the black. All right, so what I wanted to show you now is how I get to the next level of finish. I've got an area set up in my shop where I go to sand this where it's not near anything else because black is everywhere. And so I have a uh, area set up with a, a shop back very similar to this and a, a table that steps up and I will come in and I will sand. I'll keep the vacuum cleaner on with the this type of a head on it so that I'm continually cleaning out what I've done. This one I put the black on it, and then I've done what I'm going to call the sanding, okay? I start by hand, and where is that sander? But I use one of those pad sanders that uh, Vince sells. It's the long one. It's in here somewhere. There it is. Okay, this is 100 grit. These are those belts that you buy from uh, Klingspor, the box of the scraps. And I buy a, those, I like it. And then I take this little hand pad here. This is 150. 
That is as much as I send everything except right here along the top on the star. I'll take that sometimes up to 220. You notice the black is still on it. So what I've done is I've sanded all of it except this section here because I didn't think anybody wanted to watch me sand the whole thing all night. Okay? So I'll come in. I'm going to come in and try and knock off the rough edges. And it's very rough. The difference between this and this is probably from 60 grit to 150. Okay, that should give you an idea of the difference between how it feels. All right, so I come back in here and I sand it off. Now I come in and I try and get that edge knocked off here if I've got any that's too much. Okay, I better really. All right, so I come in with it, sand this a little bit, then I'll come back with this to smooth it off. Okay. And so I'll get it to this consistency right here. All right, now I'll come back with this 3M wheel, take it through like this. That smooths it out a lot. And then I come back with my uh, the regular bristle wheels, and I only go to the green which I think is the uh, 120, I'm not sure, but the green is how far I'll take it down, and I'll clean out the grooves, I'll vacuum it off. This one right here, it is, it's very similar to that. I use the green, and if I'm trying to get a smoother finish on it, I'll even go to the brown, and I've got boxes of each, and so I can go to it, because these don't last very long. And on these wheels, I go to the large wheel, I don't buy the small 3Ms and then I stack it real deep. I don't just go with the four or five. I think that's eight across there. And this one's down probably, uh, the ones I use I think are an inch and a half, so they're pretty large. And I use that just with the Dremel. Okay. So I'll quickly get this off of there. I know I just have a few minutes, so the next thing I do is airbrush yellow. I do the whole thing, give it a, a yellow base for everything. So it depends on what I'm going to do with the inside of this, what color I'm going to go with. If I'm trying to get a bright color, I'll come in with a white base, because if I seal it with white, then I can put any color and it will cover it up. No, it doesn't make any difference at all. If you're, it depends on what your goal is on the color. You can have fun with it and make the inside of it blue. You can make them pink. I kind of try to emulate a little bit of a fruit, so I'll come in with an orange, with a red. Sometimes I'll just use a bright yellow, but the yellow on the elm isn't that good, so then I'll come in with a white first, and then I'll get a bright. But I'm not using it, because as you know, the white is not transparent, it's opaque. So I use it light, I put a medium in it, and that comes in and it seals the wood. No, these are all just uh, golden, transparent uh, airbrush colors. Now, I'm not trying to dye it, that, not at all, because I'm trying to lay the color on top. And as you can imagine, I usually buy the yellow and the big bottles, because I seal everything, or come in with everything with the yellow. And then I do my colors. And the yellow gives me my color blending instead of mixing the color and then having to try to make it match if, I, if something happens. If you notice the one that I brought in here, it's got a hole in the side of it. 
and I burned some little ants into it. I've done several of them, but they've got a, a hole on the inside of it. I'll give it ants and let them walk around. Just as a little bit of something to show. Okay. All right. I'm gonna. I need to get this top done so I can show you one thing I wanted to do with it, and then I'll close them up. All right. All right. Now you can kind of get an idea of what's going to happen here. Again, I'm using the yellow base on top of the black. And everything that I sanded the black away is taking the yellow paint a lot more. I don't want my outside to stay yellow. Normally, I'm going to come back with a green. I've got a permanent green that's light. And then I have the transparent green. I don't usually use the transparent green on the outside because I'm trying to cover and get a little bit more of the shading. The yellow gives it so that I can mix the color with and get the, the right shading. Because if you just put a green on it, because I'm not going to make it a solid green, I'm going to kind of give it a very variable color, a variation. Gives it, well, I know it's, it's to take the evenness out. It's to try and make it uneven. Yeah. If that, the one that's sitting here, if you looked at the inside of it, You'll see the inside is, yes, it's orange, and yes, it's yellow, but it's got red. Okay? So then I'll come back with the green. No. No, not normally. Because it's going to mix it. I use one airbrush for one piece. Okay. All right, so now you can get an idea of the green. And this is opaque. So now I'm going to come in. I'm not giving it a solid color of green. I'm going to hit highlights. I don't know if you can really see it from there. But when you come up and look at it, if we can pass, it might be too wet to pass around. But I can decide right now on the foot how much I want it to be green at the top. So on this one, I'll take my foot and I'll make it dark green. And then I'll shade it down into the feathers. Okay, now on your, the feathering here, you'll see that you've got highs and lows. And I would probably spend more time making it to where it looks more of a blend of highs and lows. Okay, I know we're at time. I want to show you the one thing, especially that to make these things fun on the outside. All right, so I take the white. Normally I would come in and let's see. I'll show you the red a little bit, and then we'll come back with the white. Let's say I'm going to use the red on the inside to give me my color. I want this to be watermelonish. Okay. You can see it's taking an orange hue. Hopefully, you can see that in there. Okay. All right, now, now I'm going to try to go around the edges. I want this, I really want my top. I don't want a solid color. I don't want yellow, I don't want red, I don't want green. Okay, so I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to get my edge. My target, I'm aiming at this edge right here. Okay. Just do this side. I don't have to hit it exact because normally my inside is completely red. To, because with the red and the 
Th this color red and the yellow, I'm getting kind of an orange tint, which is fine. It's exactly what I'm looking for. But now, okay. Finish the red. Oh, that's just a, you buy this cleaner by the little pint and add water to it and mix, mix it up. Just a non-toxic airbrush cleaner. Okay, so now your white, because I've used the same airbrush the whole time, there's a little bit of the red, there's a little bit of the green, and there's a little bit of the yellow. Okay? Now, you saw that I came across and I made my edge red. That was my target. Okay? Now, what I'm going to come across here and do, think about a watermelon. It doesn't go from red to green. It goes to white. There's a white in between. So I've got my red coming with the white. One thing you have to worry about with your white is clogging up your gun because it is very, very thick. Okay, now I'm going to come back with my green. Just a drip. Okay, now I'm going to come back along the edge. And the, you've got to be careful you don't make it look like a Christmas tree. Sometimes you'll have to hit it a couple of times. Okay, so that really needs more red on the inside. Okay. So hopefully that gives you the idea that as you come through, you're shading your paint through. I would come through with different layers of the red, trying to make sure that I've gotten the the shading that I want. If I want it to be red, if I want it to be a yellow color, if I want it to be a mango or a watermelon or a peach. Okay. Okay. And then I come back in with a toothbrush and the India ink. I dip the toothbrush in it, kind of tap it just a little bit, and I go in and I flick it, and I get those little black dots which you can probably see in here. There's little tiny black dots. And like I said, this one was ants. Any of them with holes, they're going to get ants. I'm going to burn ants into it. And then I shoot uh, satin lacquer on it. Turn it over, take the paint off, put Texas on the bottom, and it's a bowl. That's it. So. All right, so...